Hello everyone, welcome back, and I am uh, officially back from my open heart surgery. I had it two weeks ago. I'm recovering pretty well. Just uh, bear with me as I go through recovery for the next month or two. I have to do physical rehab and all this other sort of stuff. It's a lot, but I am healthy and well, so just letting you all know that. Today I wanted to talk to you all about a study that came out actually just last month that I thought was really interesting that is comparing MBTI, the Big Five, astrology, and some other components of personality traits and tests, and really seeing how much these things correlate with life outcomes and life expectancies. And the reason that I wanna talk about this and the reason I'm making this video is because this study really kind of supports what I have been saying for a long time, in that the MBTI isn't pseudoscience, it's just not the absolute best personality assessment when it comes to correlating to life outcomes or predicting outcomes. And, and why is this important? Because in psychology, in the field of psychology, especially when I'm talking to other people who are interested in personality, I often hear the phrase that MBTI is pseudoscience or that it's no better than astrology. I've heard that literally dozens of times from other people in the field of psychology. And I think the people who say that ironically have a much lesser understanding of what the Myers-Briggs actually is uh, how it functions as an assessment, why it's important, what it's good at, and what it's bad at. But, you know, they're, they're trying to just kind of throw it in the garbage as just pseudoscience. When, when we actually look at the data, when we look at the research, it doesn't really support that idea. It just supports the idea that the Myers-Briggs is an okay assessment. So today I'm going to go through this study with you, talk a little bit about some of the strengths and weaknesses of these different uh, styles of measuring personality, and then why it's important to understand and recognize these differences and strengths and weaknesses, and in my opinion, why the Myers-Briggs isn't pseudoscience, and it actually does have value. Let's get into it. Before we dive into that, though, I'm going to take one minute of your time for a graduate-level applied research course for my master's program. I am conducting a study that is examining the relationship between personality traits and risk-taking behaviors. If you have five minutes of your time to spare in the description box below i'm going to share a link to my survey my study um, and if you click on that link you'll be brought to a consent page that will explain more about what this is and how you can participate and how it you know will be helpful to the field of psychology if you do participate so if you have just a couple of extra minutes and you would like to help me uh, complete my study for my master's program it would be greatly appreciated if you could do that thank you when you're going to be talking about the results of a study, it's really important to talk about the limitations of that study and the methods that they used before you start interpreting the results. So I'm going to bring up on the screen here some of the things that are important to know about this study. First and foremost, to my knowledge, this is more of a report than an academic uh, publication. What that means is that this was a study that was done in-house, and although they got a large amount of participants and the data seems to be good, and actually the study was shared by someone who works in personality research, so that generally means that I kind of trust that it's going to be at least somewhat valid as a uh, report, that it is not peer-reviewed to my knowledge, uh, but that it could be in the peer review process since this was just published about a month ago. So another component of this report is that the MBTI is a privately owned personality assessment, meaning that they had to use their own version of the MBTI, and which they call it the, the Jungian test, I believe, or something along those lines. Um, but essentially, they just took their own version of the MBTI that was very highly correlated with the actual Myers-Briggs and used that instead of the MBTI. That's completely normal practice in research. Uh, when you have tests that are going to be behind paywalls like the Myers-Briggs or the most famous Big Five assessment, which is the Neo-PI. Um, so another component is that they actually included Enneagram. I don't really know much about Enneagram. Uh, we can talk a little bit about it here in the results and stuff, but I'm actually not much of an Enneagram expert. So now that we have the kind of foundation of some of the strengths and weaknesses of this, you know, you, you want to make sure you know that this isn't peer reviewed and that this is more of a report than anything else. I still think the data here is actually really good. So what does this test uh, or this report essentially tell us? Well, what they were doing is they were looking at how these personality traits compared to uh, predicting 37 different life outcomes, so different components of life, such as I believe they used the example of social circles to exercise habits to overall happiness, uh, these sorts of things they compared to the personality traits. 
what they found is pretty much exactly what with it, within what we would expect for a personality trait um, analysis, and that's going to be that Big Five outperformed all of the other personality assessments, uh, including the Big Four, which is the Big Five minus neuroticism, Enneagram, and the Jungian binary categories, as well as astrology. If you look at this graph here, I think the really interesting thing about this is the uh, astrology component on the right side here. You can see that astrology had zero percent correlation with life outcomes, which is what we would expect, right? If we're using something that is actually pseudoscience, that has no scientific backing, we would expect that it's not going to have any actual correlation to expected life outcomes, which is exactly what they found within the study. Then next up from that, we have the Jungian binary categories. Now, in this report, in this analysis, they separated the MBTI um, types and then the MBTI as traits. So what does that mean? So let's say you have an ENTJ, that would be the type, then you could use that to correlate to life outcomes. But you could also take down the person's individual scores, say the ENTJ is, you know, 80% an extroversion, 70% uh, intuition, 75% think, you, you get the point, you know, we look at those individual scores, then we look at those as correlates of those life outcomes. And what they found is that if you look at things at the trait level as opposed to the type level, you're going to see an increase in performance and an increase in the correlation as compared to the type. Now, this is exactly what we would expect looking at this from a statistical point of view. When we are using a type model, we are inherently by its very definition saying that we are willing to take a hit to accuracy and reliability, and in some cases validity, so that we can have an easier uh, level of interpretation or an easier way to explain the scoring system uh, that you have to the people that you are scoring, or in general, you're just going to have a reason for having that category. And that's the whole point of the Myers-Briggs, is they have a reason for that category, and they're willing to sacrifice some of that accuracy to allow for that. Another way to think about this is that in statistics, it's actually very common to use cutoff scores for different assessments. The Beck Depression Inventory, for example, is one of the most commonly used assessments for depression. And, you know, you can score from, I believe it's 0 to 63. It's been a while since I've used the BDI. Um, so like a score of 0 to 13 would be seen as minimal, but 14 to 19, I think, is mild. So what's the statistical difference between someone who's a 13, which is minimal, and someone who's 14, which is mild. Well, you could say that there's actually not much of a difference, but that's part of the reason, you know, part of the reason that we have those cutoff points is for us to have some level of interpretation of the data. So while a 13 and a 14 might actually not be that different, it is meaningful to the clinician to be able to understand that that is a point that we have decided to be some sort of cutoff. And that's what the Myers-Briggs does, except they do it at the 50th percentile by saying that there's going to be some sort of meaningful uh, difference or at least noticeable difference once you cross the 50th percentile threshold of, say, for example, introversion and extroversion, where if you have someone who's below the 50th percentile on extroversion, they're very likely going to be someone who is not going to be outgoing, for example, or if they're above that 50th percentile, they might be more likely to be outgoing. But of course, the closer you are to a cutoff point, the more difficult it becomes for you to meaningfully interpret where you are relative to that cutoff point because you know your score can change we have confidence intervals and we're not exactly sure where your very specific score might lie if you're close to that cutoff point but what i'm really trying to get at here is that the the myers-briggs uses these as a way to um communicate that this is a communicate differences in personality, essentially communicate that there's going to be some sort of noticeable difference across the 50th percentile. Let's get back to the study, though. So if you look at the data here where they talk about the actual correlations as opposed to just the graph view, you can see that the correlation for the big five is 0.23 for the big four, which again is big five minus neuroticism. It's going to be 0.18 for the Jungian scores as traits, not types. It's 0.15. For Jungian categories, it's 0.11, and then for astrological sun signs, it's going to be 0.002, which 
which is exceptionally weak. Now, none of these correlations are huge, as you can uh, see from the graph up a, a little bit above here. I'm going to try and put it on screen here. You can see that these are all relatively um, small correlations, to be honest. Like the, like the personality traits here are not hugely correlated with these outcomes, meaning that there's a lot of other components in your life that are going to relate to life outcomes. But these aren't insignificant. They're all small correlations, except for astrology, which is not correlation at all. It's considered no correlation. But they're all within the same category of correlation, small to medium. Um, and, and what that implies to me is that while the big five still outperforms the Myers-Briggs and these Jungian traits, it does mean that the Jungian traits and the Myers-Briggs do have some sort of validity to them. They are measuring something. And that's really the, the key point that I want to uh, put out in this video, especially for people who are kind of doubting the Myers-Briggs, is that it's not nothing. It's not pseudoscience. It's not astrology. There is something there that is being measured. Another really important component of this study that I want to go over is how this study um, viewed what people thought about the personality test that they were taking, what it implied and meant for them. And in all measures, the Jungian personality assessment, the Myers-Briggs in this case, outperformed the others in um, perception of the assessment and what they gained from that assessment. So these four categories here, it made me feel good about my personality. It accurately described my personality. I learned valuable things about myself and I found it to be interesting. The Jungian test outperformed the others in all four of these categories. What does that mean? It means there's something about the Jungian personality system, the personality types, the Myers-Briggs, that draws people towards it. And you could make the case, or you could uh, make the argument that, oh, well, just because it draws people towards it, that doesn't mean that it is actually measuring anything. But we found that it is measuring something. So if it is measuring something, and people like it more than the others, or they personally feel that they're more likely to engage with it or learn something from it, that is meaningful. That means that it's doing something right. It is getting people to be interested in it, and that is going to translate into them learning about themselves and then doing something about the future. Ultimately, I have said for years now that I think that the Big Five, or the Five Factor Model, is the best personality trait measurement system there is if you are a researcher, if you're someone who's trying to get at the specifics, or if you're a clinician even, if you're someone who needs to know the specific traits of a person's personality so that you can help them or tailor interventions to help them through therapy, coaching, these sorts of things. But I think that the Myers-Briggs outperforms the five-factor model when it comes to the layperson, when it comes to the everyman who's just slightly interested in learning about their personality and what that means for them and their future. And they're not going to be diving deep into how that might impact the specific nuances of every day of their life. So that's really the kind of key point, the key takeaway that I want you to have from looking at the study and analyzing the differences between these things is that one, MBTI isn't pseudoscience. It's not astrology. Two, people prefer this style of personality assessment over something like the Big Five. And three, that the Big Five is something that is more useful and better for researchers, people who are on the back end doing research and looking at the specifics of these traits. And I really think that is important for people in psychology to understand that we can have different personality assessments that measure similar things that are useful for different reasons. Thanks for watching.